So, good morning and a happy Monday to all of you. Uh, today, if you guess that we're going to talk about the semantic phase and type systems and type checking, you are completely right. Uh, <coughs> you remember the semantic phase. First we have the scanner, which we have worked quite a lot with, and then the parser, that we have worked even more with. And then, <coughs> when the parser has analyzed the structure of the program, uh, separated expressions and statements and so on, then we get to the semantic phase. And semantics is about meaning. So for example, what does A plus B mean? Well, A and B are variables. And what does the plus mean? This, of course, depends on the language. But let's say we have one language where it's um, You declare variables like this. Well, if a and b are both integer variables, then the plus means integer addition. If, uh, let's say, both are floating point uh, variables, then <coughs> it's a floating point operation, which mathematically it's, it's the same thing, but internally in the computer, they are handled completely differently. And if it's a, a, a language that has string variables, then it's not mathematical addition at all. Then it may be string concatenation. Or if this language does not understand uh, <coughs> string addition, then it's a type error. You get an error message. And if you have... Uh, one thing a string, and the other one a number. Well, again, it depends on the, the language, the rules in the language. Can you take a string and add an integer? Well, in some languages you can, and in some languages you can't. And what happens typically in the languages where you can, then b will be first converted to a string, and then you concatenate the string, so you have string concatenation. Or if it's C, then something completely different happens, because a string in C is a pointer to a pointer to the first character in uh, an array of characters, and if B is an integer. Well, what happens in C? You address. Yeah, you move forward in the string the number of places that B says. So uh, let's say <coughs> B is 1, you would get the, the, the string that just contains I. Okay, so the semantic phase works a lot with data types, analyzes the program in terms of data types to uh, decide what to do uh, with uh, the code. Uh, since we're talking about type checking later on, let's say something about various types of checking, not type checking, but types of checking. Uh, you have static checks and dynamic checks. And you remember that in, in the context of compilers, static means things we do uh, <coughs> in the compilation phase, when the program is not running yet. And dynamic things, those are things that happen when the program runs, at execution time instead of compile time. Uh, <clears throat> usually you want static checks instead of dynamic checks, if you can choose. Why? Well, why do you want static checks? Is it so that it updates in real time? Um, could, could be. I was thinking of another thing. I mean, <clears throat> if you have static checks, then the program is checked when you're compiling it. So you get the error messages 
at compile time, when you as a programmer are working with the program, if you have dynamic checks, yeah, then you get the error message when the user is sitting with the program and the program runs. And you as the programmer is better able to, to fix the errors in your own program than the user would be. So it might be, <coughs> usually it's better to get the error messages earlier. Yeah. There are a number of uh, checks that can be done. Uh, you can have, um, if we have a small program here, Uh, here we have a C program. Well, things like this. Uh, <coughs> if you're very familiar with C, you're, you know that you can have labels in C that you can jump to, even if it's not used very much, or you should avoid using it. So, what problems do we have in this program that can be realized, recognized by the compiler? Well, say something. We have two types with the same name. We have? Um, and two labels with the same name. Yeah, which is, of course, wrong. So, you can have uniqueness checks, so you check that you don't have uh, variables or labels with the same name. Something else? Break. Yeah, break is used to break out of a loop or the switch statement. Uh, and here you will get an error message from the compiler that you're using break uh, in an invalid context. You can't break out of uh, something that's not a loop or a switch. And a final problem that the compiler will tell you about here. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> this means follow the pointer i to what it points to and set that place to the number 2, but it's not a pointer, it's a normal integer. So, <coughs> uh, you will get an error message there too. And you might also get a warning for this infinite loop if we assume we fix that error you might get a warning that, oh, we have an infinite loop here. But that's not necessarily an error, so uh, it's completely allowed to do this. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Dynamic checking, on the other hand. All these are static checks that can give you, uh, tell you what the problems, is, uh, what the problems are, and uh, uh, you will not get a compiled program out of this. Uh, dynamic checks, on the other hand, well, in your program you might um, do this and what could go wrong here? Two things. Well, first of all, malloc allocates space somewhere for your, uh, um, your program to use, and you tell it the number of bytes. And what could happen here is that you have run out of memory. Memory is full, so you don't have any more space, in which case malloc returns uh, a null pointer, and you will probably get some form of problem here, right? Uh, another problem that the compiler might warn you about is that typically an integer is larger than one byte. I mean usually bytes are 8 bits and on most normal modern computers uh, integers are 32 bits which means 4 bytes and I'm only allocating space for one fourth of this integer that I'm then putting there. And then all sorts of bad things will happen. But the compiler can look at this code here and see that, no, this is not enough space to put this uh, integer. So you could have a static check that checks that. But that memory runs out, that has to be checked dynamically. 
You can't do that at, at, at compile time. Okay? So, what is a type system? I'll write down the definition. I think many of you will already know this, but this is the set of rules that <coughs> assigns types to the various parts of a program. Or I could start by saying it's also the set of data types that uh, the programming language supports. And then you have the set of rules that assign data types to uh, the various parts of a program. And, of course, each language has its own type system. So, for example, if it's C, if we start with this part, what data type does that have in C and C++? Good. Uh, you could think it's float, but maybe surprisingly, the normal floating point data type in C is not float, it's double. So, for example, the mathematical functions like uh, sine and so on uh, take doubles as arguments and return doubles. What is the data type of this? Integer, Integer yes. And what is the data type of the expression in C? Double, yes. What happens is that this will be converted to the double 2.0, and then the, uh, the addition is a double addition. Not in this case, no. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, sometimes you have a conversions uh, the other way. In this case, you have, again, this is a double, but I'm putting it in an integer variable. So in that case, it will be automatically converted to integer. In C, in some languages, you will get an error message that you can't uh, silently lose the information here that you will lose in C, because you lose the decimals. Uh, some other terms that are sometimes used um, is strong typing and weak typing. They are used in, in somewhat different meanings. Uh, the book has a, um, uh, a definition of the term strong typing that says that, okay, a language is strongly typed if the compiler can guarantee that there will be no type errors when the program is run. So all type stuff can be analyzed at compile time with static checks. Uh, that is the book's definition of strong typing. I would say that <coughs> these terms are used, it's more like a scale where the language is more or less, um, some use the term fascistic, about the data types. Uh, you have weak typing, you can do whatever you want, and you have strong typing, you can only do exactly what the language allows you to do with the data types. So, for example, this is sort of weak. C is generally considered to be a weak, weakly typed language because you can do all sorts of things. And of course, if you have pointers, you can do even worse things. I have this variable x, which now contains uh, the number 2. And then uh, 
I can say uh, char p is set to, and I can do a cost like this. What happens here is that I create a pointer to the variable x. Here I have a pointer to the variable x. And then in the variable p, which is supposed to be a pointer to a string, I first convert this to pointer to a string. And typically on the machine level, there is no difference between a pointer to a string uh, or a pointer to character or a pointer to integer. It's just the same bit pattern. It's just that the compiler knows that this is supposed to be a pointer to uh, an integer or a pointer to a character. And then I put this pointer, after having converted it to a pointer to chore, I put it in this pointer p. And then in the program, yeah, I, can do, I can do things like print f percent s, which prints a string, but I give it a pointer p, which in reality points to an integer. So what happens here is that this will be interpreted as the bit pattern that is stored in memory representing the number 2 will now be interpreted as if it was a string and printf will try to print it. And all sorts of things can happen. Compare this to some other languages, let's say Python. Uh, it would be very difficult to, to uh, do things like this or Java. So those are more strongly typed. Okay. Uh, <coughs> These are things that can be checked at compile time, as we said. But there are also things that can only be checked at runtime, dynamically. Everything can be checked at runtime. Everything can be checked dynamically, because then you have the program started, you have it running, and you can perform the same checks that you could statically. But there are things that can only be done at runtime. So let's look at something like that. If you have um, an object-oriented language with some uh, classes, You have defined the class animal. You have uh, the class dog that inherits. If we use, um, <coughs> no, Java says extends, does it not? Yes. And in C++, you just write a colon and inherits. I think Python says inherits. Well, uh, cat inherits animal. And then let's say that the class horse, which is of course also an animal, uh, has a function or method that says you can ride a horse. If you have a function now that says uh, travel and you have an animal as arguments, the animal A, you're traveling with your animal in the parameter A. And you hope it's a horse. So you try to ride your animal. Well, <coughs> you can have, and in, for example, Java, you will, uh, a check that says, no, this is not guaranteed to work. If it's a cat and you try to ride the cat, it won't work very well. Uh, so the compiler can statically say that, no, this is a type error because it's not guaranteed to work. So that would be in a strongly typed language. In a weakly typed language, well, <clears throat> you could write this 
and hope it works. But then at runtime, when the program is run, it might fail. And the failure could be an error message. It could be that uh, <coughs> um, something completely undefined happens. Uh, but if you have a check at all, uh, it has to be done either static that says that no, we can't allow this, or at runtime. You can do um, uh, this, horse h, and get the error there if the animal A is not a horse. I mean, this is just copying uh, the reference to animal to the horse uh, variable with error checking. And then if it's not null, in some languages you will get uh, a null pointer here, uh, then you can ride the horse. But this is something that would have to be done at runtime, because you don't know what A is at compile time. So, <clears throat> if the compiler is to work with data types. Uh, it needs to represent these data types in some way to be able to compare them and um, do other things with them. And then we come to type expressions. You have, uh, in more normal languages, you have things like integer expressions such as 2 plus 3. It works with integers and gives an integer as a result. You can have string expressions. Like hi plus space plus there. Assuming now that plus means string concatenation. Uh, it works with strings and gives a string as result. But you can also have type expressions, such as, let's say we have um, Then the parts, at least uh, these parts, or there is uh, sorts of types, and the result of the entire type expression is a data type. You could have an array of float instead, for example. And these type expressions, uh, they are used inside the compiler, inside the semantic phase. Uh, typically, you don't have access to type expressions in the language, even if you, even if you could, uh, in some languages, do that. So, what is a type expression then? A type expression is... Well, <coughs> it can be a basic type, such as integer, uh, character, etc. And before I continue, remember that we said that the type system assigns data types to various types of the program. So inside the compiler, in the semantic phase, 
you may have these types of expressions, these type expressions, and assign type expressions to each part of the program. Okay? It can be a name of a type. You remember, for example, that in C you have type death. Uh, <coughs> in C you can say type def int uh, temperature. And what happens now is that temp is a name that in the case of C is an alias for integer. Now, temp here is a name of a type. Sometimes you can have type variables also. For example, if I have a normal variable called uh, x, let's say uh, I have x, which is an integer, and then I do something like this. Type of this variable t here now contains the type of whatever x is, which in this case would be integer. So the variable t contains not an integer, but the type integer. We can also create more advanced data types, uh, which are composed of other data types. And the simple one, perhaps, the simplest one, perhaps, is array. So you can have a type constructor. And one type constructor is arrayed also. of um, the size and the type. And many languages have pointers, so when you uh, work with a pointer you could have something that says that, oh, you have a data type t, and then you can have a pointer to that data type, or rather to data objects of that type. So if I say pointer to int, then this is a data type pointer to integer. Let me continue over here. Sometimes you need a whole list of data types. For example, if you are creating a function, and that function takes a list of parameters, then you could have an integer, a character, and an array as parameters. Then you need to be able to build lists of data types. Yeah. <clears throat> lists of data types, and it can be done using products. If I have one data type, call it T1, and another one called T2, and since this uh, product will be a data type, then I can continue and chaining other uh, products. So, for example, if I have uh, int times char times um, 
let's use array of five integers. Then this could be the parameter list to a function, uh, the parameter list that consists of first an argument that is an integer, then a character, and then an array of five integers. I mentioned functions, so how do I describe a function here? Well, I have a list of parameters, uh, which is a data type, and then the function will return another data type. So let's call it t1 and t2. For example, if I have this function that takes an integer and a character and an array of five integers, and it returns a floating point number, then I would write this as, okay, first I have this parameter list, and I sort of send these parameters into the function, and an arrow shows that I will get back, I think we said, a floating point number. So the function returns a floating point number. And if you want, you can read that arrow as that the, fu the function is a, is a machine that converts the parameter list to its return type. And finally, you also have records, or structs as they are called in, in C. But what is a, a record or a struct? Well, it is several fields or member variables if you speak C++. Uh, so a record is, uh, let's see if I can, I say it's a record and then it's just one of these lists so if I take that particular list here, int multiplied with char, multiplied with array five integers, like this, then I'm saying that, okay, this is a record or struct that contains one integer followed by one character followed by an array of five integers. I could go on and then define classes. So what is a class? Well, it's basically a record, except that you also have member functions and not just member variables. Plus you have an inheritance hierarchy. So uh, it is a, uh, <coughs> this uh, cat is not just a cat, it's also an animal. Okay. This is the theoretical basis for how to work with types inside the compiler, inside the uh, semantic phase. Uh, but how is all this represented? How does the compiler actually store these type expressions? Well, you remember normal expressions could be stored as trees. If you have an expression such as 2 plus 3 times 4, well, you build a tree that looks like this. Two plus three times four, and you see in the tree that, okay, this is, uh, should be done before the, um, the addition. And you can store these types expressions as, tree, as trees also. So for example, if you have um, a function that takes uh, two integers as input and returns a pointer to an integer, why would it do that? Well, let's say you send two integers, integers to it and it 
multiplies them and puts the result in an allocated space for an integer and returns a pointer to that one. Uh, then it would look something like this, int times int return, then an arrow, and pointer to integer. So how would this look as a tree? Well, <coughs> this part and this part should be, so to, say, so to speak, done first. So it is the function that is the top level node of the tree. And the parameter list consists of two integers like this. And the pointer to int well, here you have the pointer node, and the pointer node just has one subtree because you only have pointer to one thing, which is int. So. And if I delete this space here, when you actually store this, uh, you will have if we implement our compiler in C, you will have some sort of trees that look very similar to the type, uh, the uh, trees we use to represent a program in, in uh, lab number five, I think. Uh, <coughs> you have this one that says function, and then you have Uh, multiply or product you have a leaf node that says uh, uh, basic data type integer and here you also have basic data type integer here you have pointer And it's a pointer to an integer, which is the basic data type integer like this. So you can build actual trees in your compiler using normal structs and pointers that represent data types. OK? So let's um, have an example. We will look at a simple language and the rules that are used to uh, assign data types. Here we have a program and I use, if you remember Pascal and how uh, Pascal <coughs> defines variables. You can say that n, as in November, is an integer variable. So this, is a, this language is a sort of mix, mixture between C and Pascal. Uh, you can have another one saying that i is also an integer variable. And you can say that the array a is an array of, let's say, 256 integers. No, characters, better. Uh, a is a variable that is an array of 256 uh, characters. And then you have an expression using these variables. You're saying n plus a index i plus 7. Here we have our program. some variable declarations and an expression using those variables. And the question now is, this expression, what type does it have? Or is it maybe a type error? What would you say? Exactly, that's the answer I wanted. It depends on the rules of the language. Uh, <coughs> if we assume, first of all, uh, left associativity of plus, then we start with this part. 
And n is, well, it's an integer variable. So this part of the program has the data type integer. A is an array of, uh, of uh, 256 characters. And I, as we saw, is an integer. And if we assume normal array indexing rules that I uh, <coughs> write the position in the array I'm interested in here, then this part here will have what data type? Sure, exactly. And now I have integer plus character. And it depends, as we said, on, or as you said, on the language, the rules of the language. In C, it works, because what is, what is a character? It's just a small integer, the character code of that character. In Pascal, you would get an error message, because you can't add uh, characters like this. So, <clears throat> either we will get a type error, or in some other languages, uh, this will result in an integer, and then you would add another integer here. But in this language, let us say that you can't add characters and integers. So this is a type error. So let's look at the grammar for this language. Let's say the start symbol in the grammar is program, and it consists of first declarations, and then a semicolon, and then one single expression. That's the grammar for this language. And during the break, you can, as an exercise, uh, try to write the complete grammar for this language. And then we can compare your solution with mine after the break. Okay, let's have 15 minutes break. So, let's continue with our example program and Example language. <clears throat> We're writing a grammar for this uh, small language uh, and based on the example clearly we have a list of declarations so let's say that declarations can be either a name of an identifier ID, uh, a colon and some data type, let's call it tape type, or let's simplify declarations, semicolon declarations. So, <clears throat> If you look at this grammar, do you see any strangeness? Well, one thing is that it's ambiguous. If you have three declarations here, is it <coughs> that these two are declarations, then you have a semicolon, and then this one is declarations, or is it the other way, you have one single declaration, and then these two are declarations. So you don't know how to associate left or right uh, the declarations to each other. But it works as a grammar because we don't care. Uh, <coughs> then what is a type? Well, it seems we have three different data types here. We have integers, we have characters, and we have arrays of whatever. So a type is either, you say, keyword char for character, or keyword int for integer, or it says it's an array, keyword array, 
left bracket, uh, then you have a number. So num means number, like 256, but int is the keyword int that means integer. Uh, <coughs> end bracket, keyword of, and then some type. So you could have uh, arrays of arrays, because an array is also a type. And in my example here in, in the uh, lecture notes, I also have pointers, but let's ignore pointers. Then you have the single expression here. And what is this single expression? Well, <clears throat> it can be a number, like 7 here. So it's the same number as you could have as the size of the array. You can have, um, since we can have the data type character, we also probably want to be able to write characters like this, character literals like this. So let's say uh, short literal, character literal, literal, like this. Uh, you can use an ID, an identifier, as an expression or in an expression, and you can at least add two expressions to each other. So let's say you can have an expression plus another expression. And again, do you see a problem here? Yes, it's ambiguous. If you have um, n plus a index i plus 7, you don't know if you should start by doing this addition first or this addition and then that one. But we don't care about that, we only care about the data types. Or you can use array indexing. So if I have an expression and then a square bracket and another expression and then an n square bracket, then I have taken an element of an array. And you might wonder, well, what if I do some strange thing like the expression 2 and the expression 3? Should the grammar actually allow this? Should it? Well, I would say maybe the grammar should allow it, but then in the semantic phase, when you check data types, you will see that, oh, this is not an array. So then you will get an error. So the grammar allows this, but in the semantic phase, we will, we will catch that problem. Okay, this is our grammar for our language. Now we need to assign data types here to various parts of the program. And data types. Which data types do we have? Well, we have a character, integer, and array. But I will add another one. So I have character, int, array, size of some type, but I will also add another data type that our program will work with, which is basically, or simply, error. You can have a type error, so for example for the one I just erased here, you will get a type error. So I will assign integer to this number 2, I will assign integer to this number 3, but the entire has the data type error, because it's a type error. If we look at the parse tree for this, you will say that, okay, you have an expression, 
That expression consists of, since it's array indexing, expression left bracket, expression right bracket. This expression is what? Well, it's a number. And this expression is a number. And as I did here, I can assign data types to the various nodes in the tree. It's, it's the same thing I did here, but drawn in a different way. And a number, well, what data type does a number have? For example, a number two. Integer, yes. And we assume that number three will also have the data type integer. If I interpret this number as an expression, what data type does it have? Well, it's still integer. And the same thing over here. Now, if I have found an array indexing expression up here, uh, <coughs> then, well, the index should be a number. Okay, it's a number. But the, um, the part here should be an array, shouldn't it? And then the result should be whatever type the elements in the array have. But if it's an integer instead of an array, then the data type for it all will be what? Error. Error, exactly. So let's write some rules that assign data types. And you remember, we can have, uh, in the parse tree, we can have um, uh, attributes and these data types, that's the attribute type. I give the attribute type to each port here, each node. And you also remember that we had translation schemes. And, yeah. uh, because I tried to take element number three in something that's not an array, it's just a number. So then it's an error. Uh, we had two types of uh, syntax-directed translations. Uh, one is called a syntax-directed definition, uh, which has the uh, uh, productions from the grammar with semantic rules that assign uh, values to the attributes. And we had syntax-directed translation schemes, which had semantic actions similar to uh, the code snippets in Bison, in a Bison gram. So let's use one of those. And in this case, I will use semantic actions. It will work with, with um, uh, semantic rules also. Okay, uh, let's see where I can have space to draw this. I would like to just add the semantic rules uh, actions <coughs> uh, in the grammar, but they don't fit there, so we need to have more space. We had a rule that said that a program is, or a production, uh, that says that a program is declarations followed by a semicolon and then one single expression. So I take my declarations, my semicolon and my expression <coughs> and Well, the data type of it all will be what? Well, the same as of the expression here. So let me say that program uh, dot type, the value of the type attribute 
of the program node, the top node, will just be the same as that one of the expression. A type, or rather declarations, could be uh, a single identifier, a colon, and a type. And how do I handle that? Well, when I have found a declaration, I will put the variable and its data type in the symbol table. You remember the symbol table. It contains an entry for each uh, variable or function and other objects, uh, for each variable <coughs> and its type. So I would do something like this. Uh, insert into the symbol table the identifier ID. Um, and let's say, um, ah, let's say, it, um, and the type of the type, like this. And what I mean the type of the type? Well, type here is a syntactic element. It could be int, it could be char, it could say array or something and I take the type attribute of that and put it in the symbol table. And then I had another rule that says the declarations could be or is declarations semicolon more declarations. But I don't need to do anything about the types because putting things in the symbol table is handled inside um, uh, this production here. Okay, if that type is sure, the keyword character, then, well, what is the type that I will then put in the symbol table? What is the type? It is, if I, for example, have um, this declaration here, an identifier, a colon, and a type. What is the type of this? Sure, yes. And then I will put it in the symbol table for this identifier. So, sure. And the same way if it's int, if it's the keyword int for integer, then the type attribute has the value int. And if it's an array, it says array as a keyword, left bracket, number, right bracket of, which is a keyword, some data type. Well, what is the type of this? And let's add a type one there and a type two there because you have two types in this production. Uh, the elements of the array is of type two and the entire array is of type 1. So the type of the entire array, type 1, is, and now you remember these type constructors. You could construct more complicated types uh, than just char and int. And we have a type constructor array of uh, how many elements? num point value and 
of this type here. So that's just type 2 dot uh, not value uh, type like this. And what would happen here, uh, what would actually happen in the compiler is that we create an, one of these array nodes that says array and you have a pointer to uh, this integer uh, value and you have a pointer to whatever type it is that the array contains. Okay. Uh, this, I believe, covers the declarations part of the program. Uh, you have <coughs> variables of the data types character int and array, and you insert those data types uh, in the symbol table. So, when we work with the expression then, then we can fetch types from the symbol table. And we said an expression could be a number. So here I have an expression, it says uh, 17. What is the type of that? What is the type of this? Integer, Integer yes. So <coughs> I say that expression.type, the type of this expression that is just a number, is in this case, of course, integer. So, if it's uh, a character literal, which I believe we said uh, looks like this, then it is what? What is the type of a character literal? Exactly. If it is an identifier, well, what do we do? You have uh, this expression, A. What is the type of A? We have to in the symbol. Yeah, you look in the symbol table. Because <coughs> A has been declared first as a variable of a certain type. So you look up uh, uh, the, the type of A in the symbol table, so expression.type is lookup uh, ID in the symbol table, and you get its type in some way. Or Maybe I, the identifier is an object you, you can look directly, you don't, maybe you don't need to look up, um, which means search. Maybe you can just get it directly in some way. Okay. <clears throat> then we had um, addition. An expression can be an expression plus another expression. And now the interesting parts come here. Because if, if the rules of the language says, if the rules of the language say, uh, as we mentioned before, I think, that you can only add integers together, then you will get something like this. Oh, first of all, let's number the three different expressions, expression one, expression two, and expression three. If both the expressions I'm adding together or integer. So if expression two dot type is int and 
expression tree dot type is int. Then what? What is the type of the entire expression? That is expression one. Yes, you add two integers together and the result will be an integer. Else, if let's say one is an array and the second one is a character literal, what is the type of this expression? Error, Error exactly. Everything that's not just two integers that I add together will be an error. And perhaps finally, if this expression is an array indexing expression, you will again have three different expressions in our production here. Uh, expression one, which is the entire expression. Expression two is whatever is f before the bracket. It should be an array. And expression three is the number of the place in the array, should be an integer. So how will this rule look? Well, again, it's similar to this one, because <coughs> this must be an array of something. This must be a number. Well, it could be an expression, it doesn't need to be a uh, constant, it can be uh, an expression, as long as it has type int. In that case, uh, the result, well, what will the result be? What will the type of array indexing be? Let's say a2 plus 2. That is position 4 in the array a. What is the type of this? The type that the array contains. Exactly. So again, we need to look in the symbol table to find what this is. Uh, to see uh, if it is a, um, uh, an array. Well, uh, I don't think we have a way to cre create expressions that results in an array unless it's an ID, but we could have array expressions, let's say call a function that returns an array. And then uh, this doesn't need to be an ID. But what we do is, if uh, expression 2's type is equal to an array of, uh, uh, I think we say, size n of type t, then Yes, it's an array type. And expression 3 dot type should be int. In that case, everything is okay. Then it's this type here, the elements in the array, that is the type of the entire expression. So expression 3 dot type is set to t. And now this, uh, if it was C code, you would need to do something more complicated here. This is more like some sort of pattern matching. Else, well, what is the data type of this expression if this wasn't an array and this wasn't a number? Oh, correction, this is not correct. Uh, expression one here, yes, thank you. Uh, but if it's not an array and a number, what is the type of this entire thing then? Error, exactly. So, 
So it just means when we have an array indexing expression, check that it actually is an array and check that the index actually is a number. Otherwise, uh, it's an error. And if we apply this to our uh, example program, which I don't have space for, uh, well, at least I have space for the expression part. elements. And I think we did this uh, from the start, that we look up n in the symbol table and it was an integer variable. Uh, we looked up a, which was an array of 256 characters. And i was also an integer variable. And 7 is a number and it's an integer. Uh, <coughs> So we apply this final rule here. Uh, on this array indexing expression, we see that yes, this is an array, expression two is an array, expression three is an integer, very fine. And yes. Did I do something wrong here? Array of 256 char. Yes, Did we not have that? And i is. Yes, but i is, uh, was an integer variable, was it not? We had three variables, n, i, and a. And n and i were integers. So this is an integer. So <coughs> we check it. Expression 1 is, yes, it's an array of char. Uh, i is integer, so yes. This is okay. And the result will be sure. And no matter <coughs> which, uh, which way we start with this addition or that addition, we will see that one, both sides are not integers because you have either an integer plus a character or a character plus an integer. So the result of, let's say, if we start here, will be error. And if you don't stop everything and print an error message and exit, uh, then we go on to the next level here and say that, oh, error plus integer. Well, again, it's not two integers. It's error plus integer. So error plus integer well, what's the result of error plus integer? Error, error yes. So the, the data type of this entire expression is error. So now you see that you can work with the data types of a language like this. In a uh, normal programming language such as C or Java or C++ or C Sharp, uh, expressions have types like this. I mean, that's the definition of, exp of an expression. It has a value with a type. But if you have, let's say, an if statement, if A is equal to 2, then X is set to 3, does this have a value? Can you say uh, y is set to this? No. I mean, you could have a language that just lets you set parentheses around it and set, 
maybe say that, okay, then the result will be whatever you assign to x here. Uh, but typically in programming languages, this does not have a type. Or if you need to assign a data type to it, then you would have the type void or none or something like that. You get the same thing with functions. If you say uh, y is set to the function value of x, well, again, we need to look in the symbol table. What is the data type of x? What is the data type of f? And then, a bit similar to when you have array indexing, that what you write before um, uh, the brackets here <coughs> needs to be an array, then what is before the first parenthesis in the function call, of course, needs to be an actual function. And then you look in the symbol table, see it's, oh, it takes an integer's argument. Well, we need to check that x actually is an integer variable. And what will be the resulting value of f here? Well, it will be whatever that function returns according to the symbol table. And then you can compare that to the value, the type of y. And the type of a function in C and C++ and Java and C sharp uh, can be, it can be void. Then it's like doing this thing here. You want to set the variable y to the value of this if statement. You can't do that. You get a type error. But if it is the same data type, or at least compatible data types in y and the return value of f, well, then it's okay. Let's, um, <clears throat> before we finish, say th something about uh, equivalence of type expressions. Uh, we have used that a few times here. I said that, okay, if this is equal to int, if this is equal to int, if this is equal to this array expression here, uh, but is it so oh, <coughs> uh, clear and obvious what equality actually means? What does it mean that two types are equal? Well, let's look at that. What does it mean that two data types are equal? Well, <clears throat> if I compare the data type integer with integer, then yeah, it's not difficult. Is it integer or is it not integer? And if you compare, let's say, int and float, they are not the same. But let's say we uh, use C here. You know, type def can give us an alias for a type. Let's say that I want, as we had before, a temperature. Um, this is just an integer variable, but if I create now the variable t, which contains a temperature, and say it's 17 degrees, then I have a variable t which contains 17, okay? I can do another type def. How much money do I have? I have the variable m, and I set it to 1000. So here I have the variable m, which contains how much money I have. And it contains 1,000 in whatever uh, currency I use. Uh, 
And then I write t plus n. Is that okay? I take the temperature, which is 17 degrees, and add to the money I have, which is 1,000. And it's, of course, 1,017. But what does it mean? Is it okay to do this? Well, it, as everything else, depends on the rules of the language. If it is C, which are used in the code here, then yeah, it's allowed, because these are not really new data types. They are just aliases for integer. I can use them in my program as data types of variables, but they're just aliases for integer. So T and M are integers, integer variables. In another language, we might not be allowed to do this. Because then, okay, they're both integers in reality, as they are stored, but temperature and money are obviously two completely different things. You can't add them together. And what we have here is the difference between name equivalence and structure equivalence. Structure equivalence <coughs> means that if they have the same structure, then the data types are equivalent. And in real C, where both are integers, we have structure equivalence. I mean, they're integers. They're stored as integers. They have the same structure. If we have this hypothetical C-like language that does not allow this, because a temperature and money are different things, then we would have name equivalence. It's the name that's important. C has structure equivalence, comma, uh, that is, if you have an array type with five integers and another array type with five integers, they are considered to be the same type. But there is an exception. C has structure equivalence, except, maybe surprisingly, for structs. It sounds like maybe structs should have structure equivalence, but no, they don't. Uh, <coughs> example, if I have um, this struct uh, money with uh, int uh, dollars int Sense. If I create this, da this data type, dollars and cents, to represent money, uh, and why did I do this? Well, because you shouldn't represent money with floating point numbers. And why shouldn't I represent money with floating point numbers? Because of cents. Say again? Of, of the cents. Of? The money is not always on a, a round number. Yeah, uh, what I mean is... Um, or what you mean, is that <laughs> you get this rounding error at the end and banks and such people are so... Um, um, they are not reasonable when the money does not exactly match. And I have another struct uh, <coughs> that says coordinates int x int y. These two uh, structs have exactly the same structure, two integers. And if I have, have a two variables of this type, struct money m, which is uh, $100.02, and I have a struct 
coordinates <coughs> C. Let's say, oh, this is not. Uh, well, we can have exactly the same numbers. This is just x uh, value 100 and uh, y value 200. Then you cannot write m plus c because that's an error in c. Oh, well, actually, you can never add a struct like that. I can't do this. I can't take my coordinates and put them in my money. But other than that, C has structure equivalence. What is, what is best? What do you want? Structure equivalence or uh, name equivalence? What's easier to implement? Say again? What's easier to implement? Mm, yeah, for the compiler writers, but for your programmer who actually are going to use this language, what do you want? It makes sense to be a name, uh, a name equivalent. Yeah, uh, seems so to me too, because when I'm mixing my temperatures and my money, uh, that is probably not what I want to do. So, usually I would say name equivalence is best. Okay, thank you for today.